could go. Uh, Roseanne, it says this meeting is being live streamed. That was you, right? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm trying it because we just reached 100. Cool. Uh, yeah. Are you okay with that? With yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that that was you, like, initiating that action. Um, cool. All right. So, you know, let, let's start with this, uh, you know, little caricature of how you might go and implement gradient descent out there in the real world. Um, and, you know, this is not valid Python code, <laughs> but it's, you know, it, it should be just enough to give you the, the idea. Um, what do you do? Well, first, you, you know, you go and build your optimizer and you, uh, you know, you pick a learning rate for your optimizer. And then when it's time to go and do a gradient descent step, you get the weights and you get the gradient of those weights. And then you do this update rule, right? You update the weights by taking a step in the direction of the gradient scaled by the learning rate in the opposite direction. That's the minus sign. Um, okay, you'll notice that I've got these like big yellow warning signs saying dot detach. Um, okay, I don't really know what the background of people in this room is, but could you, um, like people on camera, could you nod if you know what I mean by those detaches? And more generally, if you know what the concept of like a computation graph is um, when doing automatic differentiation. Okay, nod poll says like four out of nine. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. Um, okay, uh, remember that, uh, I don't have slides for this by the way, so I'm just I'm just gonna talk and you're, you're just gonna listen. <laughs> um, remember that when you're doing um, something like back propagation through a neural network. Well, how does that work? You go and compute the loss function from your inputs. You know, you do your linear layers, you do your activation functions, you do all of these mathematical operations. And if you're using something like PyTorch or JAX, what it does is it remembers all of the math that you've done on your inputs. And then when it's time to do back propagation, it kind of propagates the derivatives in from the opposite direction from the loss function all the way into the parameters. Uh, is this a familiar picture to everyone? Okay, so now you've got your gradients. What do you do next? Well, you do a gradient descent step, but remember that the gradient descent step is also just math. And so if you're not careful, what will happen is that your new weights will just have edges pointing back to the old weights. And the next time you call back propagation, it'll go from the loss function up, you know, into the weights of your program. But then through the update rule, it'll just keep going back into time into the previous set of weights. And, you know, it, it'll just keep going all the way back through time. Uh, does, does, that, does that make sense why that would happen? Okay, and the, these dot detach calls, what they do is they snip off these edges. They they say, no, do not continue back propagating through this mathematical operation because I don't care about the gradients of anything that comes before. All right. Are you all with me? If you have a question, now's a good time to ask it. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna proceed. So okay, so I just talked about like this detachment that everyone has to do when they're using a gradient descent optimizer. And, um, you know, I'll say if you go spelunking in like the PyTorch source code, um, you'll find something similar. It might be in the form of like a torch.nograd annotation. It might be in some other form or it might just be setting the grad to null or something, but it, it does, it is a thing that needs to happen. But right now we actually do care about the gradient of alpha with respect, sorry, the, the gradient on alpha, because that, that's what we're trying to find to update alpha. So actually, we don't exactly want to detach all of everything from the computation graph. We want to leave something in. So the, the, the newer picture looks something like this. Um, the first thing we do is we get the gradient of alpha, and we do a little gradient descent step on alpha. You remember this like new hyper step size kappa that we introduced? That's where that comes in. Okay, then we take a step of gradient descent on W, you know, same thing, get the gradients of the weights and then push them in the direction, uh, push the weights in the direction of their gradient, but 
we no longer detach alpha from the computation graph because we actually care about the derivative being taken or we, we care about this computation that's being done here. You know, it's important that alpha was multiplied by this gradient to scale it, that that's the work of the optimizer. Okay, so as written, this now allows gradients to flow through the computation graph just enough to deposit a useful gradient on the learning rate. Cool, okay. Here's the next thing we do, we, we look up at this part, and we realize that there's some like poor coding style happening here. You know, this this stuff on top, this alpha update looks just like a standard SGD update. So why are we repeating that code? So instead of writing all of this out by hand, we replace it with just a call to the regular SGD step. Okay, so you know nothing changed between these two slides. All, all that happened was that I consolidated that gradient update on alpha using the standard SGD step. Okay, good. Um, here's one last thing we can do now. We notice that we're you know using SGD to update kappa, but really in principle we could have used any optimizer. And so let's let's just abstract this function a little bit, like make it a little bit more general to allow us to choose which optimizer is used to update kappa. So I'm going to just add a parameter to this, which is the optimizer to use. And now at each step, here's what we do. We use this optimizer uh, or this kind of meta optimizer to step the learning rate. And then we do, you know, we we use the new learning rate to do a standard gradient descent step on the weights. Okay, y'all with me? Can can someone nod or something? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Great. So, um, you know, here here are some things to say about this. Thing one is, um, we don't have to work out any derivatives by hand anymore. So so that that's a win. Um, thing two is notice how we can not just use SGD, but in fact, like an atom optimizer, we can just replace this code over here with the more sophisticated update rule of an atom optimizer or RMS probe or um, ADA grad or, you know, wh whatever whatever you want to use, um, you can just sub that in and it'll, it'll, it should just work. And similarly, this recursively fed in higher level optimizer, you can, you can also, um, you can also replace that with um, you know, whatever, like an atom optimizer or something. Okay, and then here's the third thing. The third thing is we can use one of these recursive optimizers as the optimizer that's fed in. So over here, I wrote hyper SGD with opt equals SGD, but I could just as well have written opt equals hyper SGD, and I could have just kept going and stacking more and more hyperparameter optimizers. Um, this is that second reason why you might not want to work things out by hand is, um, you know, if you had to work things out by hand, then you would have to do that separately for each mix and match combination of optimizers that you wanted to use. Uh, but because of automatic differentiation, now we have this kind of unbounded space of ways we can combine and nest and stack uh, kind of mutually, or I guess not mutually, but re recursive hyperparameter optimizers. All right. Um, so good. So, so this in the chat asking about whether alpha and cap kappa are constant or parameters. Uh, here, I'm going to go look at the chat to um, to see what what exactly that question is asking. Um, Ah, right. Okay. So you're uh you're asking like if if they were constants, but really they're not constants now, right? They're um they're part of the computation graph because we want to track um we want to track their gradients because we 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 want to track how they affect the loss function in the next step. Uh so so they're not just like raw constants. They, you know, they in PyTorch language, they require grad. Um, other other questions, Roseanne, or should I keep going? Um, I, I, ha I had one question. Yes. Uh, so if you start chaining, you know, uh, these 
I mean, these recursive uh, uh, rules uh, for doing updates. What kind of stability criteria uh, can you guarantee on this? I mean, it, it would seem like at you know higher orders, you could start slingshotting all over the place. Yeah, that's that's a good question. That's um, at least in this paper, that's considered an empirical question, and like. Within 10 minutes, Audrey will show you some graphs showing where in kind of under what circumstances this kind of thing is stable and is helpful. Um, I don't know if anyone has tried to work out like the theory of theoretically when we can expect it to be stable, but I think it would be an interesting question. I know that for just one level, people have worked out the theory of this, but I'm not sure for higher levels. Okay. Um, I think that would have probably be more related to the the shape of the of the loss function. Um, if if the higher order derivatives of loss functions are close to zero, I would imagine that it would be stable. But if it's kind of pathological, like you have a discontinuity in in a loss function, it would probably get crazy. My yeah, question is kind of related to this, which is like, what happens if you add like momentum to the hyper um, optimization? Yeah, well. Okay, the, these all sound like questions that will be answered shortly by Audrey, who will show you some tables. So I am now going to formally hand it off um, to Audrey, who will give you some experience. I guess before before I do that, I just want to, um, here, you know what, I will stop sharing so Audrey can get set up. And in the meantime, I'll, I'll just say like, um, Aud Audrey joined this project as a sophomore um, through the MIT Europe program. Um, Europe means undergrad research opportunities and, you know, did all of this amazing work. So first of all, it's a treat to get to hear from her. Um, but secondly, like if any of you are in positions at your universities or at internship programs to promote undergrad research, like you, you, you know, that that's a great position to be in because undergrad researchers do awesome stuff is what I've learned from working on this paper. Okay, Audrey's all set up, so I'm now just going to let her go. Um, yeah, off you go, Audrey. Um, cool. Does everything look right? Yep, I can see your slides. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kartik, for the great intro. Um, and a lot of the questions, um, that, like great questions that were asked in the chat, hopefully will be answered um, in like these following slides. But if not, just like um, we'll make sure to answer them at the very end. Uh, yeah, so let's take a look at a few experiments. Uh, so the first experiment that we tried was we trained an MLP on MNIST with different optimizers. Um, the first observation is that the hyper optimizers generally improve test error over an ordinary optimizers. Um, you can sort of see in the tables on the right, like the first line with like just SGD or just Adam means that we're using an ordinary optimizer. Um, for SGD, the final test error after, or like the test error after we finished training was uh, around 8.99%. Um, and then uh, like the subsequent lines with the forward slashes mean that we're stacking an additional hyper optimizer. And what's really interesting is that like in the case for SGD, if we just stacked like one additional SGD hyper optimizer, so we're now, um, yeah, so we're stacking one additional SGD hyper optimizer, like the test error sort of reduces from 8.99 to 4.81, which is really surprising. And this pattern is just um, seen with both SGD and Adam. Um, another thing to note is that we can uh, mix and match optimizers on the top and bottom, meaning that um, here, for instance, uh, SGD can be off like the hyperparameters of SGD, like the learning rate can be optimized by Adam. Likewise, in this lower table um, right here, right, the hyperparameters of Adam, like the beta one, beta two, and the learning rate um, can op be optimized by SGD, sort of. We do this like mix and match thing. Um, uh, and then Lastly, like this learned, the final learn step size, or like what we call the learn step size, which is the values in pink here, often show better convergence than the initial human chosen step size. Um, these learned hyperparameters are the value that the hyperparameters like end up as at the end of the train run um, using the hyper optimizer from the previous line. 
Um, so we take these final values, we fix them as constant, and then train using that value. Um, and then, as you can also see, the, the test error for these values are um, generally less than that of the ordinary optimizer. And in some cases, they are even better, like in some cases, they are even better than um, the hyper-optimizer optimizer combo. Um, can I ask a few questions on that table? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so first of all, the first one, the first table is SGD. What's the default learning rate? Uh, the default learning rate was, I believe for these ones, uh, the learning rate was set to 10 to the negative two. Okay, so 0.01. So it looks like the ones that are doing better that are not hyper-optimized, but you use the hyper-optimized learning rate and then set it. So the, the pink ones um, are doing better than them, but interesting because some are smaller, some are larger. Is that right? Oh. No, wait, you said 0.01, so they're all larger. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like uh, for the SGD table, yeah. we Like the original SGD value is 10 to the negative two, and then, yeah, these ones are larger than that, yeah. Okay, so that's an interesting observation, I guess. It's the, the, the original one was too low, too small. Yeah, there was, yeah so like, yeah, they, they sort of pumped them up a little bit. Mm. Or some other question? Would that indicate that they're being stuck in the local minimum the, with a smaller time step, the smaller learning rate? Um, yeah, it could mean one of two. Well, yeah, so it could mean that they're like, it sort of gets stuck in a local minimum because of the like too small learning rate. Um, uh, one thing that we did try to, like we made sure to do was that like we uh, finished the training um, or like we trained for the same amount of time, um, but we trained until convergence. Uh, like we we looked at the, uh, we trained until convergence for the just like a or ordinary optimizer. We looked at how many epochs that took, sort of trained for the exact same amount for all of the other ones. Um, yeah, so I guess like one thing you can think of is like maybe they're getting stuck in the local minimum um, and they're not able to like get out of it. Another thing can be like, um, uh, like another thing could be like um, the hyper optimizer sort of like converges faster. Uh, it could be one of like there's, uh, I'm sure there's like also other explanations, but I think these are the two ones that like I had when I looked at this graph. Yeah, yeah it's interesting that the best ones, the best performing ones are like way larger than we thought. The learning rates. Yeah, like that. that is very strange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they all, they all started from 0.01, right? So they get to 0.59 by the, the hyper uh, optimizer through 0.01. Yeah, it's like a very, like, yeah, it does bump it up by a lot. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay, so I will continue to the next slide, which is like a very, it's like a very, like we use the exact same set, setup, except this time, like we repeat it with like um, different types of optimizers, such as Adagrad and Narvis prop. Um, and we find that the same properties hold. Um, furthermore, we can optimize other kinds of hyperparameters beyond just the step size, um, such as the gamma hyperparameter in RMS prop, which is like the smoothing constant. Um, and then being able to adjust both of these hyperparameters also improves performance. And uh, like uh, just as a side note, um, all the hyperoptimizers that you see in these two tables were all like impl implemented in less than an hour. Um, it just shows like that this is really quite a simple like uh, this is really quite like a simple method. Um, and then furthermore, that like hyperoptimization is useful for many different types of optimizers. We next wanted to see whether or not this method would work on larger models. So we trained a ResNet 20 on SciFAR 10. Um, and in the original ResNet paper, the network was trained using a custom learning rate schedule, um, which divides the learning rate at epochs 100 and 150, which you can see on this graph um, on the far right. Like this blue line is the, um, uh, this blue line is like, us reproducing the 
the exact like uh, training parameters as like the original paper. Um, and this is depicting the learning rate over time. In this blue line, there's like sharp decreases at EVOX 100, 150 due to the schedule. Um, so we do uh, three comparisons. First is with this, um, first is with the original papers uh training like parameters then we did um then we decided to um remove the custom learning rate decay schedule but still keeping the ordinary optimizer and then lastly we removed the schedule and then swapped out the ordinary optimizer for an hy a hyper optimizer uh the hyper optimizer uh, matches the final test error at 500 epochs and perhaps what's even more surprising is that um, the adjustments to uh, the learning rate alpha very closely match the hand engineered schedule. If we were to like draw sort of a curve between these points, if we were, if, if like yeah, if we were to smooth out this ske this schedule, um, yeah. So the the black like uh, if these tags are if the color of the tags are not very visible, but this this black line here is. Um, the hyper optimizer with no uh, learning rate the case schedule. And the final test error is matched at 500 deep box. Um, what this means is that like the learning rate is being adjusted according like according to this like optimal schedule. Now what happens if we vary the initial human chosen hyperparameters? Um, this time we're varying the initial values of the learning rate and momentum. Momentum is on these columns and learning rate is along the rows. We find that the hyper optimizer always converges better than the ordinary optimizer. Um, furthermore, the final test accuracy in nearly all configurations matches the optimal hyperparameter initialization. And the only places where it fails to do this is when um, the hyperparameters are both bad in the same direction, meaning that um, both like the learning rate alpha as well as mu are both either too small or too large. Too small, in this case, we're saying that mu is like 0 0.09 and alpha is 0 0.01 versus alpha being set to one and mu being set to 0 0.99. Um, what this means is that like, if you were to use like um, when you're training a model by yourself and you're like going through the decision of um, figuring out which values um, to initialize like to initialize your hyperparameters as, you can be off by like a whole magnitude. And if as long as you were using a hyper optimizer, the performance should be um, fairly like the performance should cover. Um, now, referring back to the Baden um, and colleagues 2018 paper, um, in the paper, they hypothesized that stacking these hyper optimizers would make them increasingly robust to the initial human chosen hyperparameters. Um, our experiments validate this by initializing the bottom level learning rate to different orders of magnitude. Um, so you can see on the figure on the right, uh, Along this uh, x-axis, we're plotting the bottom level learning rate um, on a log scale. And then on the y-axis, we're plotting the test error. Um, and then for each of these lines, this gray line corresponds to height equals zero. And then that means we're just using an ordinary optimizer. And then the red line, which um, is labeled height equals three, uh, means that we recursively stacked three hyper optimizers with one optimizer. Uh, like on the graph, you can see that like with an ordinary optimizer, um, it performs poorly for um, learning rates that are smaller than um, 10 to the negative four. So like around this axis, yeah. So it's doesn't really, um, so like these these initialization this entire like, range of initializations is like not good. Um, furthermore, this entire range is also not good. Um, however, when we look at like a stack height of three, like it obtains reasonable results across like a wide range of magnitudes, um, with a caveat that it fails for initial values of like um, of like ten. So th this point right here would be. Um, 10 to the 1, here would be 10 to the 2, 
which is like uh, initial values of 10 and 100, um, which are really quite large. Now we use the same hyper step size configura uh, configuration, meaning the, the initialization pattern um, from the previous experiment for um, the ResNet 20 and RNN experiments. And we find that this pattern still holds. Um, we find that the height of three obtains pretty good results across a wide range of initial, um, of bottom level um, hyperparameter initializations. Um, this is true for both the ResNet 20 as well as the RNN. And then recall from the very beginning um, how we wanted first, like we, we wanted something that was both simple as well as lightweight. Um, well, we know that this implementation is simple because a new hyper-optimizer can be implemented within minutes. Um, but this is like this method is also lightweight because each additional level increases the runtime linearly by just one to two percent. Um, so this graph on the right here is we're plotting um, stack height along the x-axis. So like how many levels of hyper-optimizers do we have versus the percent increase of runtime over the ordinary optimizer. And um, you can see from this plot that it's like increasing by one to two percent um, each, like each additional level. Um, furthermore, it also has negligible additional mem memory usage. Uh, now, just to summarize this presentation, um, we, uh, the first the first idea is that hyper optimizers are a lightweight and flexible tool for improving your optimizer's convergence. And then also, if we're careful with our implementation, we can recursively stack hyper optimizers, which makes them um, less and less sensitive to the initial human chosen hyperparameters. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for listening. Um, I guess this is the end of our presentation and we'll um, open up for any questions. I, I have one question. Uh, most of the plots you were showing, you're plotting against the uh, loss function, uh, or the, the uh, loss. I'm just kind of curious uh, what the shape of, if you looked at the alpha as a learning rate schedule, what shape did that actually take the alpha parameter itself? Uh, yeah, so I, I um, uh, should I reshare my screen? Maybe that's a good thing to do. Uh, yeah, so if we like, so the one plot that we did plot like alpha in was with this like ResNet, our first big like ResNet 20 paper. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. Yeah, so for here, it like decays it. Um, but we did see like um, in the previous uh, table experiments um, for like these, the, um, the MLP on MNIST, uh, the like the learned alpha will, will be like bumped up over the course of training. Okay, I, I was just curious if, if you hadn't been told that it was a stacked set of optimizers, if someone had looked at that, whether they would recognize that as a, uh, as a more conventional learning rate curve of some sort. Oh, it's just like this, uh, this like curve here does. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, um, a lot of like schedules sort of will just like, like decay the learning rate, like uh, continuously over time. So um, it, it probably would like, like if you plotted the learning rate of that, you would probably see a similar curve. Um, though, I guess it's like, this is, yeah. So like, yeah, if you just sort of did like continuous decay, you'd probably see something very similar. I, I just wonder if it had a, it, in a lot of cases, whether it just followed a functional form that uh, would be, you know, closed form with well, like one parameter or something. Uh, I think you can see that there's a, a linear regime in there where it, it, the the errors and or the, the rate is decreasing linearly. That's, that's a pretty common, um, uh, functional form that I've seen. Uh, yeah, I guess um, I haven't like exactly tried to like look at um, or just like try to figure out like whether or not the learned 
like the learn schedule um, obeys like some sort of like function. But I think that would be interesting to look at. Yeah. Is, yeah, um, some some kind of regression on it. Is the I noticed that the blue one seems to sort of get down to a to a a low test error faster. Is there something about the the sort of um, the rate of convergence that you've looked at and and seen with the different levels or? Uh, yeah, so if you look at the blue plot, so this is the one with the custom schedule. Basically, um, the blue line, <laughs> it's quite hidden behind uh, the gray and black lines, but like the test error is actually like quite comparable between, sorry, the hyper optimizer, like the, comparable to the, like the curve um, from the hyper optimizer um, up until like epoch 100, where you have this like sharp decrease. And then that's because of like the division of the learning rate. Uh, yeah, so you so it like decreases very sharply um, at this like 100 point. Um, I'm not sure if this was your question. Please let me I know. Think, yeah, I, I mean, it, it looks like if the if the hyper optimizer dropped the learning rate faster around that time, then it would converge faster. 